Well, very nice to be here, to see you all, and um, thank you for the invitation. I'm here probably mostly because I am, uh, I've been coordinating the Nordic Center of Excellence. Yes, that's mine. Uh, for some years, and we reported, we came out with a final report at the end of March. Can you all hear me? It's working fine, that's great. The name, uh, what we have focused on in this Nordic Center of Excellence is the transition, climate change and transition of infectious diseases um, in the north and how it impacts um, the health of animals and uh, animals and humans, and also we try to look at the societal effects. When you look with a so-called holistic, there are many words, holistic, one health, integration, uh, we have a complex issue, we have already heard that, from climate change and how it affects us and our lives on this globe. And um, we are part of this environment. And there my, uh, you can divide uh, the environment into the natural environment, the man-made environment. And then uh, we have uh, uh, ecosystems with animals and also with uh, people. And, uh, People di uh, live differently. Not everyone go, uh, goes to the food store to buy, but some people prefer to live this way. And uh, who, who, um, who is where uh, we have to deal with human rights here as well. I will, this is mainly what I'm going to discuss with you the next 15 minutes or so, but let's. Um, move a bit to um, uh, further expand what Joachim described so well for us. And that's just very recently, this article came from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. And the Arctic amplification, that is the speed of climate change in the Arctic, is four times faster than in the rest of the globe. Uh, the previous IPCC, you know the latest one, on natural environment came out in August last year. They still state that it's like twice the speed, and even that was considered to be uh, extraordinary. But uh, this nature publication seems solid, so the speed is really it's worse than we thought before. And this means that um, things are happening in the Arctic, for local communities, the indigenous peoples up here, but also it's a driver for change uh, in the rest of the world. That's why we have to study what's happening here. That's why we very quickly uh, have to draw all the knowledge that we can out of this region, because we are like, uh, I heard someone say, use the expression, we, we have to catch a, a, a flying bullet. Uh, because we can really um, maybe be preventive or mitigate what's happening in the rest of the world if we understand better. That's why we are in the Arctic. Of course, um, things are also happen in the on Antarctic and research are going on there as well. Yes, so that's why uh, one reason why we should have an Arctic perspective and um, it's the speed. So it's a learning lab for the rest of the world. And then, of course, uh, we know that it's, the globe is, uh, the Arctic is very connected to the rest of the world. When I started to work with this in 2007, um, and I guess still some people, I came from Stockholm here up to Umeå, people in, uh, uh, in further south and even here in Umeå thought that, you know, the Arctic is you know, you, we all have the picture, you know, it's the silent, the lonely man skiing across the, uh, the, the snow up there, and like the Nansen mythology. Uh, certainly, um, you all know by now that's not uh, the truth. 
So it's well connected to uh, the rest of the globe with, go with the currents, the atmospheric interactions, ecological and social systems, commerce and trade. And not to be uh, not mentioned is that these waters are extremely nutrient rich for mammals of different kinds and fishes. So they travel here and they eat and get fat. And when this changes, uh, we will also have an effect on, on the, if you call it, production of um, food for, for, from the sea or for these ecosystems. And of course, it's the home for indigenous peoples for millennia, uh, supporting global trade for centuries. This part of the world has been always connected to the rest. And this is just um, one picture for you to show that uh, the the big currents in the oceans, that's how they move, bringing hot, warmer water up into the Arctic to cool down, uh, go down, deeper down, and then come up to the surface. That's why we have the Gulf Stream and different streams. That's why we here in Scandinavia uh, have the nice life we do have climate-wise so far. So why am I here today? As I briefly started to explain to you, it's because we were fortunate to be funded by um, uh, Nordforsk as one of four Nordic Center of Excellence who are supposed to do research for added, added value um, to uh, the Nordic countries. Um, and the reason for this is that warming landscapes, migrating vector organisms, change in social, so societal exposure, societal effects, one health approach. Um, those of us who joined here, we thought this, this was really important. And as I said, we have had the final outcome and we have had about 60 peer-reviewed publications, more to come. We've been to many conferences. We've been in media, all kinds of media, as an important part as well, outreach. And we, we are accelerating educational impact. We were allowed, uh, encouraged to include Russian colleagues, and we worked a lot with them. Uh, I worked a lot, especially the uh, last years. So we've seen a bit more of that. And we were given uh, more funding to deepen our contacts, especially with younger colleagues, networking. Uh, the contract was signed in the beginning of February, and of course the money was withdrawn. But after a couple of weeks, uh, they said that um, you can have the money if you take out the Russians. <laughs> so we did, and uh, we're working now with uh, people in Greenland, and of course with uh, other uh, Nordic friends as well for added value, but with the same concept. And uh, uh, yeah. We just heard, Joan, thank you for your nice talk, Joan. Uh, you talked about interdisciplinary. We have, we can all agree upon, uh, we heard you, Joachim describe it as well, we have very complex problems and we need complex collaborations. I'm an infectious disease doctor and, uh, you know, when we started out, we were like 49 seniors. And when you start out with 49 seniors, uh, uh, I will bring up some personal thoughts about ethics all along, and this is one ethic, I think. Uh, when you uh, bring along senior researchers, they are usually in their own little comfort zone, and it's very nice, it's very easy to say, yes, I will do this, and I will step out of my comfort zone when you uh, put your name on the uh, application. Uh, but then to deliver is another thing. And because you really have to, and I think it's almost impossible for uh, people if you have been working for a long time with your own language and field and you have your own network, to really uh, get into. And this is a problem. It's an ethical problem because we need to, if we want to solve problems, we have to uh, create people or networks uh, from the beginning, when, where young people can meet, discuss, understand each other, and know each other. Because when you have an application, you have three months to write it, and you sit and you write day and night. Uh, you, you take the person that you know, 
you know, you can, uh, how are you supposed to find someone? <laughs> so if you want, you can stay with multidisciplinary, which I would say we did, which is added value, which was appropriate for us because that's what they asked for us. But I would have liked to mo move more into interdisciplinary and then involving communities more and, and even maybe transdisciplinary, which is probably a, a, an illusion. But um, so multidisciplinary, you can uh, substitute, substitute these words for additive, interactive and holistic. Uh, of course, if you want to do your PhD, you you should stay in in uh, your field, you know, and deepen. So it's uh, it's difficult, really, to have a career path that goes with uh, interdisciplinary. So this is something that should be considered by uh, funding bodies, I think, because just throwing out money, you know, big money, wow. Uh, well, that's not really ethical, I think, if you want to really uh, deal with complex collaborations. Uh, Joan brought up uh, SDGs. That's another thing. Uh, Nordforsk, in our project, we had to do a little thing about, and also in our final report, uh, which goals have we worked on and what have we accomplished. I think that's from an international level. We, all these... All the Nordic countries have uh, um, signed contracts with the United Nations to follow, and uh, we should all taxpayers' money, when distributed into different projects, should have this element as well. How do we work together uh, towards uh, what's considered these days to be a good thing to work for? So stress that. Okay, so which situation are we in? We heard it excellently from Joachim, but let's, repetition is the mother of knowledge. So the global mean temperature in 2021 was 1.1 degree higher than it should be. We are approaching 1.5 and it will probably not stay there. What is happening? Well, uh, we have, this, these are just a few examples adding on to previous speakers, increase of Arctic river runoff and more future landslides. I just also, also want to stress that I mentioned here, uh, uh, you, um, uh, average or mean values. There are reports that these are, could be rather uh, not so interesting because there could be extreme events that makes an ecosystem change there's a tip, tipping point changing into another uh, uh, ecosystem, and this is an irre irreversible uh, action. So that could mean more on a local, regional level uh, than average, average. So take the average just for what it is. It's what I, we found in our, in, this, in our project is that there are local and even regional uh, differences uh, in uh, distribution of um, of uh, uh, infectious diseases. It could even be different from one valley to another. So increase of fires, absolutely. And I can, if you have a, a moment over, why not look at Siberian times? I, I find it lovely. You li find lovely stories there that you never <laughs> can imagine. And um, it's like New York Times or Los Angeles Times and all kinds of stories and also facts. So even in the east of Siberia, Yakutia is huge, one million inhabitants, but the size is like India, the uh, subcontinent. And they have lots of fires. And how will that affect through the dust? And Snow extent and seasonal du duration will continue to decline. Continuation of reduction of numbers and of a mass of glaciers. Reduction of Arctic sea ice thickness, extent and average age. Perennial sea ice is being replaced by thin seasonal ice. Sea level rising in Arctic Europe. This is just from uh, a picture photo from um, 
uh, Alaska, but uh, in, um, especially in northern Russia, there are reports on railroads falling down, housing. And they've actually, I heard some, yes, I met this Finnish guy who was actually building housing uh, uh, accommodation in the sea outside, uh, in the Arctic Sea, because of uh, the rapid thawing of the permafrost. And this was an issue brought up just a few years back in Alaska, where in the graveyards, the skeletons uh, started to appear because of the thawing. So the community brought it along to the uh, leaders that uh, this was, of course, a hygienic uh, problem for the hygienic staff. But it's also a very, very much a deep cultural problem. Because uh, especially if you live in a culture where ancestors are very, very important, uh, this is, you know, what's happening. Who, who are we when we are in this uh, con uh, situation? And what will we become? It's an identity crisis. And what about the future? Well, the human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. So we are moving from the stable Holocene that could have lasted for another 1,000 years to Anthropocene. And uh, the report from WHO in 2010-20 say, stating that climate change may be the defining global public health threat of this, this century. And then we've already heard this, either direct or indirect pathways. Heat, floods, you just wonder what's happening in Pakistan these days. Drafts, vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases, food-borne diseases, social systems. And more than 75% of emerging infections are zoonotic. And Jan Semensa and the co-workers, I don't know if you were part of this. Yes, you were, yeah. So I, I really like this. Uh, uh, drivers of infectious diseases um, were defined into three categories. Globalization and environment, social and demographic, and public health systems. And with public health systems, we're talking about how you monitor and, and do surveillance of what's happening. Do you think we do enough of surveillance of uh, uh, wild animal diseases in this country? Do you remember uh, there were a number of um, articles, because the journalists like this, uh, that um, there, uh, uh, there was an introduction of a new tick that was jumping after people? Don't you remember that? That was like 2018, maybe. And it was in all of the papers. Well, it was part of our clean project, actually. Uh, because before, we just, uh, at Uppsala, the uh, uh, Veterinary Institute, National Veterinary Institute, they, uh, they asked people to send in ticks and then they would look at it in, as a part of this work. And uh, so then people absolutely did this. So we did involve the uh, community a bit, but I wouldn't call it interdisciplinary in a way. So anyway, they gladly sent it in with all the troubles that meant. And all of a sudden, hyaloma, this gigantic, uh, big, jumping tick was found on some horses in Oxelösund and then further north, etc. And no, then also another tick, um, the tiger tick from Russia was found in, in, in detected in, uh, in Jämtland. And they bring in uh, new diseases. This hyaloma can bring in uh, West Nile virus and others. So this was just random through a project. We have very little surveillance. It depends on, uh, how, uh, on nice hunters who find a dead animal and they s take the trouble to send it in to, uh, for dissection. Um, and then we have uh, reportable diseases for humans and also for uh, some animals diseases as well. But for example, it, it, uh, it's very different in the Nordic countries. Borrelia is not reportable in Sweden, while it is in Finland and Norway, etc. So 
Although we think we live in the best of worlds, we do not uh, when it comes to surveillance. Even I was shocked when I, surprised when I saw it. So climate and the national environment and land use is a big driver for infectious diseases, as well as water and uh, how biodiversity uh, changes. It's said that it's losers and winners. And um, here you see that the winners are small, the smaller, more short-lived animals. And they usually bring in so man, much more of the pathogens. We're talking here in Umeå, when I say uh, pumula, uh, I guess you know, uh, sorgfeber. You all know, in Stockholm, no, very few know about sorgfeber. But it, it's that kind of animals, the you know, small mice, that will increase. So we will see more of them, what is claimed here. And then we have human-made environment, uh, pollution. We'll hear more from Arya shortly. Travel and tourism, migration, global trade. So there are many drivers, but definitely climate is a big one, the change. And why so? Well, we don't move that much. In Pakistan, they have to move, but they usually move inside and Bangladesh, inside their own country, so far. Uh, in, a, in a period of time, uh, it won't be enough. We'll have uh, climate refugees en masse, most probably. But the animals move, of course. The polar fox is being driven out into the Arctic Sea by the red fox. That's one example. The beaver is moving north, like it did in uh, Alaska, because the willows are moving north, and they like willows. And with beavers, you have, uh, for example, um, uh, pathogens, parasites in their intestine that will cause diarrhea in humans. So when you drink water from a clear river up north, it might well be uh, contaminated with cryptosporidiosis and uh, Giardia lamblia, for example. By now, I think you, you all agree that climate change and the ecosystem health is well connected with human well-being. And in the, we have all the species moving around here. So we looked at a number of potentially climate-sensitive infections. And um, when I presented this in 2016 in Norway, an infectious disease colleague in the audience said, well, you know, infections in the Arctic, in the Arctic, uh, could it really be interesting? And just a few weeks later, there was this anthrax outbreak uh, on the Yamal Peninsula in um, Russia. And it, partly because of the thawing of the permafrost. That's not the full answer, but that's another story. But definitely thawing. And they have, like, in the Siberian Arctic, they have 7,000 graveyards with animals, uh, uh, buried because they died of anthrax. We have anthrax in Sweden as well, but it's highly regulated. Here, they don't really know uh, exactly where it is, etc., etc. And it's thawing. And you can just imagine to try to dig a grave in, uh, in the permafrost. You, you don't do it uh, too deeply. If you want to read more about what we have accomplished, you can look at klinf.org. So anyway, this is just one that we are working with now. Six out of eight, uh, eight zoonoses that I briefly showed you um, uh, showed a significant change. And I don't have a pointer, but to the left you have latitude, so you can see that it's moving northwards. We, uh, Thomas. Tierfelder made these maps. And uh, these, so we have a database that's open for everyone. And that's very important ethical things, an uh, ethical thing. Because so much taxpayers' money through the years have been uh, put into creation of different databases. And then when the project has ended, that's it. So there is, you know, with new modern technology, our methods and statistical capacity, maybe we can use diff, uh, different sources, put it together, and get the truth out of it, facts. 
We also have, of course, landscape. Uh, we have uh, climate data from the Finnish Meteorological Institute, and then also uh, lots of landscape variables. So what we did was to look at regional levels, and the money to collaborate with uh, Russia was actually to try to uh, do regionally there as well. But that, yeah. So you see uh, Siberia. 22% of uh, the Earth is permafrost. The biggest tundra is in Siberia. And we have, at the moment, no access to data. Uh, we have three huge rivers moving into the, flowing into the Arctic Sea. The Ob, I w visited there a couple of years back. At times of the year, during the year, it is 60 kilometers wide. You can just imagine uh, the debris it's bringing out into the Arctic Sea, and you saw, you saw the currents being there, taking it within a couple of weeks all around the globe. It's interconnected. And we know very little of what's in there. So we really need to get facts. The EU-funded um, um, project Interact is working very well. It's been going on for quite some time. They have 98 research stations all around uh, the Arctic to collect data. And one is at the River Ob. That's why I uh, visited there. So it's really the current situation is so terrible, terribly sad for many different reasons. Of course, I must also talk about uh, the importance of local knowledge. We have people who have lived in the Arctic for millennia. They uh, usually, in many parts, have an oral tradition. It's really needed to uh, grasp this knowledge and make use of it. I mean, if you have survived here for millennia, uh, you, you know a lot. <laughs> also, it's a question of human rights. The first slide you saw is that, you know, people, this is the San people in um, Ka the Kalahari Desert. Um, not very many left. And here we have the Swedish Sami. And the Swedish uh, state has not yet, to my knowledge, ratified ILO 169, which is uh, a constant complaint from the United Nations that Sweden has not. You all know, many of you are familiar with this. So this is certainly, you know, um, ethical things that's on a national level and also on a regional level. Not everyone wants to go to the uh, CONSUM or ICA. We must show respect to communicators. They shouldn't be flooded with hate and uh, uh, threats to their lives. I don't know how you deal with this. It's, it's an ethical problem for all of us. I think they really should uh, go after these IP addresses and look at who, who is doing this. You can't just open your mouth and do, you know, silence people like this. Uh, I think uh, somehow um, this has to be dealt with, the social media and how you're allowed to express yourself. There are good things happening in Greenland. The University of Greenland, which is expanding even into uh, starting with the um, medical faculty. They have the Institute of Health, Nature and Health. It's the first in the world. I mean, solutions might not be found at Harvard or Oxford, but, uh, you know, anywhere. And it may be especially here. And I think this is just the uh, way of thinking is so avant-garde and interesting. Happy days, happy days. Just three years ago at the Moscow State University, uh, one of the biggest, well, the biggest university where they have a marvelous department of geography. And we, we were doing great things with them. But we work on, 
we don't lose hope, we work on. So I'm co-arranging these pieces on the move. And it's not just for ecologists, because we're trying to expand our networks so we can work interdisciplinary, not only with communities, but also with other fields. Um, and this is, I wanted to, if someone here is a medical student, this is the Swedish branch of the International Federation of Medical Students who are very much into health and, um, and climate change. And uh, so the younger generation has a lot of uh, uh, energy. Health might be a good approach um, to, um, uh, to reach out to people about climate change. Lots of researchers, a number of uh, well think, good thinking researchers think that. Sir Andy Haynes, I just visited, um, I, I just participated yesterday in, in a symposium on planet, planetary health. And um, uh, he, he just um, came with a book, Planetary Health, which is recommendable if you really want to get into it. It's, it's not too difficult to understand. We talk about uh, ecosystem and their services. It sounds like, what can they do for us? But what can we do for the ecosystem? So uh, just this morning or yesterday, I read that the Swedish parliament has now said no to repairing damaged uh, nature, although the EU commission has uh, you know, suggested to all member states that this should be done. Um, Swede, the Riksdagen voted uh, just this past week, this week, I guess, and said no, because it would hurt the forest industry. So. A four-year-old like this one can be in reverence of what he sees. And I just wonder, when do we lose this reverence? You know, what kind of people are we? Uh, maybe it's time to go back to feel this reverence again uh, for nature and ecosystem. And let's produce some service back to the ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you for these important points. Uh, questions? Comments? Don't be shy. Maybe these are such big things that people don't know what to... Although everybody agrees very much, I think. It's, uh, there's a question at the end. Thanks very much. Um, I just wondered if you had any reflections on the fact that you end your talk with our reverence to nature, but actually most of your discussion was about risks from nature. And actually you, it, all other not, species were defined as uh, well, risky to us. Yeah, well, but I, I disagree a bit with you there because it wasn't about risks from nature because if all these risks come from the, ant uh, the Anthropocene era that we have uh, uh, started out. We, ha we all live, we lived in a Holocene stable era before the industry. I didn't bring uh, in the history here because the time wise, but it's, this started in 1769, you can say if you want to date. And um, when James Watt actually uh, improved the steam engine and later had a uh, patent on it. So, uh, uh, yes, but the risks are caused by us. And destroying, na uh, uh, doing these things to nature. Uh, so that's what I mean. Maybe we should go back and, and um, scrutinize that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So in light of um, what you told us about the various risks and how interconnected the whole world is through the ocean currents, for example, and, and other things. Um, and this, I'm wondering just about the implications for our ethical obligations. So if we just focus on the, the ethical obligations uh, of uh, uh, Nordic countries, just as societies through their democratic governments and uh, 
definitions of public good and how they uh, spend public money and so on. Uh, what if you could now for a moment just have a very influential talk to all the heads of states of the Nordic countries, how would you try to change their priorities based on ethical obligations that derive from the information that you have presented? Well, uh, it's urgent. And uh, uh, the one major thing also in response to the previous question is to lower the uh, CO2 emission wherever you can. It's as simple as that. And then from, from there you can, you know, start to fund uh, interdisciplinary work and see, tell the universities to create career paths for young people that will improve health. But uh, uh, what uh, Andy Haynes, Sir Andy Haynes said yesterday um, on Zoom was that uh, maybe the, the health perspective is a smart, if I can use that word, clever way to introduce this whole concept to people. But we cannot deny that we are uh, narcissists, more or less, some more, some less. But uh, if it really hurts us, our bodies, minds, uh, we might be more willing to lower those CO2 emissions both as individuals and as a collective. Okay, thank you very much. And I think we need to move to the final talk of the session.